Freedom is yours from your heavenly Father through our Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God I'd like to study with you today is the, mainly the Gospel reading, but uh, also within the Gospel reading is the quote from the Old Testament reading. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit, so you might want to open up your worship folder and you can follow along and, and study God's Word with me together today. You've been following the Jamie Kloss story at all? Did you guys hear about that? 21-year-old man uh, broke into her house in the middle of the night, murdered her parents, and kidnapped her. She's 13 years old. She was only, I think, about a couple of hours away from home, up in northern Wisconsin, but she was held captive for 88 days. Can you imagine what it would be like to be kidnapped? Or what it would be like to, if your children or grandchildren were kidnapped? It's got to be a horrible, terrifying experience. And yet, that is our common experience. Spiritually, every single one of us has been kidnapped by sin, Satan, death, and hell. And the only thing good that comes out of being kidnapped is freedom. You can't imagine what it was like when Jamie Kloss finally found an opportunity to escape from her captor and, and, and she found a lady out on the road that helped her, called the police, she found a safe place and, and she got to go back home, although life is completely different now, isn't it, for her? But, but, but I can't even imagine what it must have felt like to go from being captive one minute to free the next and yet that is what Jesus offers us today. Jesus comes and preaches a sermon to us today through Luke chapter 4. And in that sermon, Jesus proclaims freedom. So two weeks ago, we learned about Jesus' baptism, which marked the beginning of his public ministry. And right after his baptism, which was done in the southern part of Israel called Judea, it was near Jerusalem at the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness. We'll hear more about that in the first week of Lent. Well, apparently Jesus stayed down in the southern region of Judea for a few months, maybe up to a year, and gradually started to make his way north into Galilee. And that's where Luke picks us up. He says, Jesus returned to Galilee, still in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So, so Jesus, after he gets out of the wilderness, he starts going to the Jewish synagogues, where they would know all of the Old Testament prophecies. right? Where there is this group of people waiting and watching for the promised Savior. And so Jesus starts going into the synagogues and essentially saying, I'm here. And the news spreads. Now we heard last week that as Jesus got into Galilee in the northern region of Israel, he went to a wedding and he performed his first miracle. And so that also started to, to help spread the news around. And everyone was excited to hear about Jesus. But now on this day, he comes to his hometown. Verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, Saturday, he went into the synagogue as was his Custom. Now, this is just a little aside, but it would have been Jesus' custom from just a little boy on to go to church on Saturday. That, that's what his family did. In fact, we hear even that Mary and Joseph took Jesus to Jerusalem when he was 12 to celebrate the major festival of the Passover. And as was his custom, just like us, Jesus listened to God's word and learned and grew in wisdom and understanding. And by the time he was 12, he had already begun Teaching. He was asking questions and, and helping the teachers, the adult teachers, to understand Scripture better. But now that he entered into his public ministry, his custom included not just attending church, but also, when invited, preaching the sermon. And the way that often happened in the synagogue, they didn't have a, a pastor like we do. That's, that, that's the designated person to give the sermon every week. They had traveling preachers. And so when Jesus went to a synagogue, he would be invited, would you like to give the sermon today? And that's exactly what happened on this day. He stood up to read, and the scroll, this is no coincidence, is it? The scroll of the prophet Isaiah is handed to him. He unrolls the scroll. He comes to the appointed reading for the day, and he reads Isaiah 61, which we heard twice. And then he rolls the scroll up, 
And they gave their sermon sitting down. So he went over and he sat down. And everybody in the whole synagogue, they're staring at him, waiting to find out what he's going to say. Now Luke doesn't record the whole sermon, but he gives us the theme. And it's this. In fact, it's on the front cover of your bulletin. <coughs> Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Isaiah was talking about me. Jesus said. If you go back and read the rest of Luke chapter 4, you find out not everybody in Nazareth was very excited to hear that because isn't that the little boy, Joseph and Mary's son, you know, the, the carpenter? He can't possibly be the Savior, but that's for a different study. Today what I want to do is to go back and look at the fulfillment of the Scripture because when Jesus said, today this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, that applies today just as much as it did 2,000 years ago. So let's go back, and we're going to kind of go back and forth because Luke um, essentially quotes Isaiah 61, but there's a phrase here and there that have some different words, and I, I want to pick up on those. Both of them start out, the Spirit of the Lord or the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me. This is about a year after Jesus' baptism, but he hasn't forgotten. He remembers how on the day of his baptism, God the Father spoke from the cloud and sent the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, not just so that everybody else would know, that's my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased, but so that Jesus would have the power of the Spirit, as as it's said in verse 14, to go out and carry out his work as our Savior. As I said with the kids, we usually think about the perfect life, the innocent death, and the resurrection. But Jesus also came to preach and teach the good news that he himself was about to accomplish. And the Spirit gave him the ability to do that. Then he says, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. I want to spend just a couple of minutes looking at the audience to whom Jesus preaches his sermon. To the poor. Sometimes I, I hear you guys say, it's really hard to understand the Bible and pastor. We need you to explain it to us. But today I want to flip that around. You help me understand. What does Jesus mean when he says that he came to preach to the poor? Do you think that he meant that Jesus, that he came to preach good news only for people who have just a little bit of money? How do you know that's not what he means? Who, for whom did Jesus come to be Savior? All people, right? So Jesus didn't come to say, well, I, I came to save all people, but I'm only going to tell the people that have a few dollars and not the wealthy. No, so, so here's another principle of interpretation. When you're reading the Bible, if something doesn't make sense or it's unclear, then we look to the context. The verse is right around us. And the very next verse in Isaiah says, He has sent me to bind up the broken Hearted. The poor and the brokenhearted are the same people. So now we have to figure that out. So, so now we say, well, what does the rest of Scripture say? Maybe you remember another one of Jesus' famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. That started with the Beatitudes or the Blesseds. You remember the very first Beatitude? Blessed are the poor in spirit. I think that's our clue. Now we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, let's start with the opposite. The Pharisees were rich in spirit. Because when they looked in the mirror, they said, wow, now there's a good-looking guy who who, uh, is good character, who works really hard to keep all of God's law, who certainly is better than everybody else. Remember the, the Pharisee who prayed, God, I'm so happy that I'm not like that guy over there or the rest of people. I'm a really good guy. And guy, or God, when you look at me, you should say, oh, that one? I'm going to choose him because he's such a great guy. See, the Pharisees were rich in spirit. They thought they had character and life and and things to offer to God. Now, Jesus preached to them, but they didn't hear the good news because they didn't think they needed it. The poor in spirit would be like that publican who wouldn't even look up to heaven but just beat his chest and prayed, have mercy on me. A sinner. The poor in spirit realize that we have nothing to offer God. 
Poor in spirit realize that be, because of our sin, there, there is absolutely no good reason that God should love me or forgive me or bless me in this life or, or give me eternal life. In fact, as we often confess that I, I've done evil, I haven't done good, and I deserve nothing except God's punishment now and into eternity. And the poor in spirit, they're brokenhearted over their sin. The poor in spirit realize that by their sin, they grieve God. Do you think God is more angry or sad about our sin? I think he's more sad. And his anger and wrath is actually a result of... Of his sadness. Just like a parent who tells his son, don't climb the ladder. And then the son climbs the ladder anyway. And then falls off and breaks his arm. And you get upset because you got hurt. And I don't want to see you get hurt. And that could have been prevented. Why didn't you just listen? And God is angry when he sees that we are hurt. And so when we understand God's grief and sadness, it breaks our hearts. And when we begin to see how our sin hurts other people, it breaks our hearts. And so with the Pharisee, we can do nothing but beg for God's mercy. Jesus is preaching to the poor in spirit who are brokenhearted over their sin. There's a couple of other descriptions, though. He goes on in both Isaiah and in, in the quote in Luke. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. That's in Isaiah and then in Luke chapter 4. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. That's Jamie Claus, isn't it? She was a prisoner. She was held captive by force, by fear, by threat, by manipulation, however he did it, this young man held this young girl captive and made her do whatever he said. But it's you and me too. We're held captive by sin. Here's how you know. Try, try this out this week. Pick one sin, just one, because anything more is, is way too much. Just pick one sin... And try not to do that this week. And try not to lie. Try not to lust. Try not to be greedy. Try not to get angry. Try not to look at everybody else's life and think that they've got it better. Just pick one. Last year for Lent, I tried to give up sugar for six weeks. I couldn't do it. It's like the alcoholic who's trying to give up alcohol or the drug addict trying to give up drugs or the, the sugar addict trying to give up sugar or someone who's addicted to porn or the opposite sex trying to give all of that up. By our own willpower, we cannot overcome. We're captive. We give right back in. And if we're captive to sin, that means we're also captive to Satan. He doesn't present it that way, does he? My wife was watching these really scary videos yesterday about sex trafficking. And it was all about, and Wisconsin's terrible, we're like the third highest ranking for this issue. And it's all about men who want to control women. It's mostly men controlling women, but they often don't do it by fear. They do it by manipulation, by making the girls think, this is a really great thing. I'm going to treat you special. I'm going to give you attention. And, and they suck them in, and then they are held captive. And that's exactly what Satan does to us. He makes us think that freedom means we get to do what we want, and we deserve it. You deserve to eat a bucket of ice cream after you work hard all day. You deserve a six-pack. You deserve to go find some pleasure over here if your spouse isn't giving to you. Here, you all, the, the devil makes it all sound like this is all for your good. Then we get sucked in and we're captive. And if we're captive to sin and we're captive to Satan, then we're captive to death. Now, I don't know if you're still working on your New Year's resolutions or not, but even if you find the cleanest diet, and you work 20 minutes of cardio every day the rest of your life, and you quit doing all things that are bad for your body, whatever that might be, sugar, smoking, alcohol, this, that, and the other thing, until Jesus comes, you're still going to die. You can't escape it. And we should be captive to hell, but Jesus proclaims freedom. 
Jesus proclaims freedom for the prisoners, release for the captives. And there's just one more description. It says that he also proclaims recovery of sight for the blind or release from darkness because sin had so clouded over our eyes and our heart. On our own, we could not see God, or, or, or at least all we saw of God was an angry judge because by nature our conscience tells us that God expects holiness, God expects perfection, and we have not lived up to his expectations. And so then we, like Luther did, we get angry with God for expecting something that we can't give, but we can't see that he's actually our loving father who sent his son to die for us, who sent the Holy Spirit so that we could live in complete freedom. We don't see that. But Jesus today, that's what he proclaims. Jesus proclaims freedom. The best part, though, is that Jesus didn't just come to proclaim freedom. He came to accomplish it. My favorite movie is Braveheart. You ever see that? It's kind of old now. Uh, Mel Gibson plays William Wallace, who's trying to keep Scotland free from uh, the, the, the rich nobles in England. And he works really hard, and he starts this rebellion, and he gets some things accomplished, but at the end, he, he, gets, he still gets captured. He gets caught up with a woman, and he gets captured, and they put him on this rack that likes literally pulling him from limb to limb, and all he can do is, freedom! And he like screams out, and then the movie kind of ends. But Jesus doesn't just scream, freedom! Jesus actually came to accomplish it. Jesus entered into our dark world. And he went to battle with the captor. Jesus went into the wilderness and he faced Satan one on one. And he defeated Satan. The reason the Son of Man came was to destroy the devil's work. He defeated Satan by resisting every single one of his temptations. Jesus came to face one on one the captor of sin. And he prayed in Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way, but there was no other way, Jesus took the cup of suffering and wrath. All of the anger and all of the sadness about God for our sin was laid on Jesus, and it nailed him to a cross. Jesus fought the captor of death. He entered into the darkness of the grave, and his body lay perfectly still for three days until on Easter Sunday morning, he burst forth from the grave and revealed his glorious light. And Jesus even suffered through hell for us and then went to proclaim his victory and now promises that all who are anointed with his spirit, that all who have faith in him, they have freedom. And that's what Jesus proclaims to you today. You are free from sin. You don't owe God a single sacrifice for your sin. Not a penny. Not even a prayer. Jesus paid for all of your sin. Your debt has been wiped clean. That means that you are also free from Satan. Satan has been locked up in prison, and while he might still be able to tempt you, you now have power through Jesus and the Holy Spirit to tell the Satan that he has to get out of your life and leave you alone. You are now free from oppression, from God's law. You do not have to wake up every morning and wonder, does God love me? Have I done enough so that God is happy with me? Have I done enough so that when I close my eyes for the final time, God will actually welcome me into heaven? You don't have to worry about that because the very same spirit that anointed Jesus anointed you in your holy baptism. The spirit of the sovereign Lord came upon you and God the Father said, you are my child, I love you, and with you I am well pleased. In fact, Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's your entire life. You live free. From sin, Satan, death, hell, and any expectation. But why did God set you free? God didn't just want to remove the captivity. God wanted to give you true freedom, which means that now you have the ability to live a life to his glory. And we're going to talk more about this next week. But as I I said to the kids, it's really no different 
than what God sent Jesus to do. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on you because He has anointed you to preach good news to the poor. He sends you to proclaim freedom to the captives. Do you know anyone else who has been kidnapped by sin, Satan, death, or hell? It's every single person you know. And Jesus wants them to know that he set them free too. Can't imagine what it would be like to be kidnapped. And even worse, I can't imagine what it would be like if someone kidnapped one of my kids. But that's exactly the spiritual condition that we all inherit. But Jesus has set you free. Free from sin, death, Satan, and hell. Free to serve God and live in his light. Jesus proclaims freedom. And today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God transcends all human understanding. It will guard your hearts and minds in true faith and true freedom until life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join with me in declaring the Christian faith. We'll use the Apostles' Creed. The words are printed for you on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.